This is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. Your war room for insider news and draft analysis from deep within the confines of Cowboys headquarters at the Star in Frisco. The Dallas Cowboys select T.D. Lamb. Oh, and now, your hosts, Brian Broaddus, David Hellman, Bucky Brooks, and Kyle Yeomans. 106 days until the NFL draft, and we are one day post-college football season as the final tape has been submitted and the draft process has officially started after a national championship win for the Alabama Crimson Tide last night. It's already sparked some debate behind the scenes here on the DallasCowboys.com draft show, but now we take it into the forefront. We'll talk about that national championship game, and there is plenty to get to about the Cowboys draft process because, well, there's a new defensive coordinator in town, and we're going to talk about that as well. Brian brought us Bucky Brooks, David Hellman. I'm Kyle Yeomans. Glad you're all with us here on this Tuesday morning draft show. One of two this week. Of course, Thursday at 10 o'clock we'll be back as well. But well, Dave, I know you're upset because Nick Saban and Alabama ended up winning a national championship. But are you upset about the Dallas Cowboys defensive coordinator coaching hire? Because I feel like that's a little bit more uh, is that good enough to make you feel better about the whole situation? I mean, honestly, I'm not even upset. Like at this point, if you don't, I mean, you're just numb. You know, being upset at Alabama winning a national title is like being upset about the sun rising. Like, what are you going to do? <laughs> uh, so, no, that's fine. And and yeah, I, I mean, I'm I'm not going to go as far as to say like I'm elated, but I I like the hire. I think it makes a lot of sense. I said this yesterday. If you read the tea leaves of what Jerry and Stephen Jones have been saying for about the last month and a half, this checks a lot of their boxes because it's it's very obvious that they regretted trying to do too much during a pandemic, overhauling the defensive scheme. Uh, it was just too much for them to handle during you know a year where you don't have an off season or a training camp, at least not a true training camp. And so they basically just reversed course back to what they were familiar with. And maybe that'll rub some people the wrong way, but... You know, at its at its best, those defenses under Chris Richard and Rod Marinelli were not bad, and so I I understand the appeal of trying to get back to what's familiar with for them. Brian, do you agree with the hire of Dan Quinn? I mean, this is a new defensive coordinator that'll change things up from where Mike Nolan was, but uh, I also kind of want to think about what it would change from a draft standpoint. Yeah, you know, I do like the hire. And what I appreciate about the front office is, and, and we've grown accustomed to the Cowboys dragging their feet when they need to make a decision. And what I was worried about with so many coaches, uh, you know, so many teams needing head coaches, they've got to build staffs. If you're a, if you're a, a coach that's interviewing for a head coaching job, you know, the one thing, the question they're going to ask you is, okay, who do you have on your staff? Who do you have lined up? You know, and if these coaches are all saying the same names and then all of a sudden they start taking these jobs and then the best coordinators go with other programs, you know, the Cowboys have always been a team that's just been so slow to make adjustments that way. Talking to folks around the league, I have friends in Atlanta that, 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 that think the world of Dan Quinn. Uh, they say the problem really with the Falcons over the years is they've had an offensive, a different offensive coordinator every year. So just with Dan, you know, the things with the defense and what he could do, uh, how he could teach, I think, that's, I think that's really the most important thing right now is that how, you know, how is he going to teach? You know, that's the thing that, you know, that, that, that this team really, really lacked coming out of the box. They didn't do a very good job of handling the pandemic, the Zoom calls, stuff like that. And it wasn't until the very end. So I'm positive about the way the Cowboys moved. I'm positive about what I'm hearing about Dan Quinn as a teacher. And I think, like, though, going forward, though, the Cowboys made the right decision. You know, Brian, let me pick you back on, on your comment about Dan Quinn. Like, I love the movie. Because I felt like the scheme that it had previously with Rod Marinelli and Chris Richard was the right scheme for the way the Cowboys wanted to play. Like, if you think about your defense, it has to complement your offense. And if your offense is high-powered, then your defense doesn't necessarily have to be the dominating group. It can be the bend but don't break. It can be the one that can sit back and play coverage and just try and 
keep the explosive plays from happening. Now, with Dan Quinn, Dan Quinn is an outstanding teacher. I think what they do is they have always done a really good job of getting young guys onto the field early. You will hear him talk about a couple of things. You hear him talk about urgent athletes. The kind of guys that they want on their defense will be explosive, instinctive. They'll be twitchy. And he won't necessarily worry as much about some of the size components that some coaches can get hung up on. The other thing that you will hear quietly, and I don't know how much Mike McCarthy will let them do it, they have a thing in Atlanta that they did called the Plan D program. That was their developmental program for all their young guys. They required all of their young guys to stay after practice for 10 minutes every day, and their coaches would work with them on an extra individual period. Mm -hmm. Over time, if you think about those 10 minutes over the course of the season, it wasn't a coincidence that in Atlanta their young guys were able to play weeks 10 through 16 and 17 because they had done all that preparation time. So hopefully it would allow some of the younger players to develop and actually get the attention that they need to go forward to be able to be contributors. Yeah, that's a great point, Bucky. I think this is a program that Tom Dimitrov, his days in New England, you know, Bill Belichick had coaches, there, the assistants to the assistants, they were working with their practice squad guys, the young players, getting those extra reps for them. So that, that's a, it's a heck of a plan. And, and in this day and age, you're right, you have to go play with your young guys. Well, imagine what that kind of uh, at least extra coaching that, and that teaching could have done for a guy like Trayvon Diggs or maybe a Reggie Robinson uh, a year ago. I mean, just that extra uh, attention might have been enough to push them a little bit more so over the edge. And sure, we're going to talk about a lot of these draft picks and, and, and things like that into the future with Dan Quinn, and he's going he's gonna to have probably the majority of this draft going toward his defense because of the needs that are there for the Dallas Cowboys. But how much does the hiring change the overall needs in the scheme of this defense, Bucky? Because I feel like whenever it came to Mike Nolan, he was looking for the taller, bigger corners that were uh, that were athletic. They weren't necessarily twitchy. He wanted physicality on the edge. Where does things like that kind of switch for Quinn? Well, now because of the scheme, the cover three scheme, the most important piece of the puzzle, I think, in the back end, are the safeties. You cannot run a single high defense without two A-plus safeties. One of those guys can be down in the box. That can be a banger. Um, he needs to be active. He needs to be able to, like, the more that he can do, the better, meaning if he can blitz off the edge, if he can play and run support, if he can cover tight ends, that's great. Your center field safety has to be a dude, and the priority has to be able to get someone who can be the ornament on the top of the Christmas tree, meaning he's a center field player who can get from numbers to numbers, he has plenty of range, and he's a playmaker. And so I would think that the position that's been ignored for years in Dallas, they have to invest in a safety, whether that is in the draft, that is in free agency, the safety has to be a high-level player. Dave, that sounds like music to our ears as a uh, part of the Cowboys who haven't necessarily valued the safety spot over the last two decades or decade, I guess, at least. But wh what do you think about uh, where the guys at the current moment on the Cowboys fit? And is it still a huge need to go get a safety that could be an A-plus player? You know, it's funny, and that goes back to my point about you know, in a way, maybe this is a little bit of a knee-jerk hire. That sounds like a mean thing to say. Like I said, I, I think it's I think it's a good hire. I think Dan Quinn's a good coach, but I don't think you can underestimate the current situation on why you would make this hire. Because you know, you look at the Cowboys right now. You look at how they underperformed. You look at their cap situation, which is not. It's going to be a mess with what they have to deal with with Dak Prescott. This hire just basically allows them to go back to what they were already doing. Like, the foundations of this defense were built around guys that can play in this scheme. And so now you think, like, okay, we don't have to worry about Demarcus Lawrence doing something new. We don't have to worry about the safeties being asked to do something that they don't know how to do. People probably don't want to hear this, but maybe this even allows you to, to try mm -hmm. to recl reclaim Jalen Smith, you know? Yep. Um, you know, Dan Quinn... He, he's been famous for years for having a, something that they call a Leo role, which is basically like a Sam linebacker designated pass rusher hybrid role. Uh, Bruce Irvin did it for a long time in Seattle. It's something I could imagine Jalen doing under Dan Quinn. So when you think about the fact that, first of all, the Cowboys don't like to spend big, and second of all, they don't have any money this year to spend big even if they wanted to, it makes sense that they want to switch back to a scheme where they can just plug what they already have in and there's at least a realistic hope for better results. Now, having said that, 
yeah, safety is still obviously a huge need. It's been a huge need on this defense forever. I don't know how they address it. Um, they're not going to spend big on him one in free agency. I think we all know that. Yep. And then there's not a guy that you feel like, as far as I know, there's not a safety that I feel amazing about taking in the top ten of this draft. Maybe in the second round, maybe. Uh, but, you know, there's not a there's not a Jamal Adams in this draft class. So that's going to be interesting to see how they do that. But, yeah, I mean, talent at the end of the day is everything. Dan Quinn, you know, he got the Falcons job off the strength of the Legion of Boom. And however good he might be as a defensive coordinator, it really helps when you have three Hall of Fame caliber players in your secondary. So it's it's absolutely something they need to look at. I just yeah. I don't know how quickly they can do it. Sorry, Brian. Yeah, and, and no, no problem, David. I think you made excellent points there. And Bucky, you could also address this along with me too, as from a scout's perspective. You know, all year long you've been studying a certain type of mm. player, and now you have to flip. But at least you've done this before. So, you know, I, I think that, that to me, it's it, the, the, the key here is going to be how quickly everybody can adjust back. It's like, okay, some of these, maybe these hybrid players that we were looking at might not fit. Oh, we're looking for a bunch of stand-up guys. Okay, we don't need stand-up guys anymore. Okay, this is, let's go back. So, as a scout... You have to flip your mind to maybe some players that you gave grades, maybe for somebody else, now they come back into your mix. And so uh, Will's going to have to get with Dan quickly. Uh, they're going to have to get their defensive line uh, position done. Are they going to make other changes at linebacker? Are they going to make change, changes in the secondary with the coach? So, you know, uh, with those coaches. So, yeah, mm -hmm. as quickly as they can get this going, it will help the scouts who are sitting at home right now trying to figure out, okay, I got a new coach here. Now I got to adjust how I look at these players. It's funny, Brian, because here's the thing about Dan Quinn, and I don't want to be Debbie Downer, but <laughs> when, when Dan Quinn in 2019, he took over calling the defense in Atlanta. He was the head coach, defensive coordinator, and he did it for half a season. Then he handed it off to Raheem Morris right. because he was having a tough time doing it. The most important coach will be the secondary coach. And so they will have to make a decision. Are the guys that are currently there good enough to do what they want to do with Dan Quinn calling it? Because that secondary coach has to fix all the other stuff. Because Dan would be great up front. And sometimes when you have a guy that is a, uh, who's done his work as a D-line coach, they can, they can dominate the front seven, but you need someone to be able to fix the back end. The Leo role, I think that'll go to Randy Gregory. I think part of the reason why mm. this move was made is how can we salvage the pieces of the puzzle that we already have? Randy Gregory can play Leo. The last time we really looked at Jalen Smith and LVE playing in a high level, it was in this defense. So could he conv did he convince Mike McCarthy? I can get those guys to play at a high level because I'm going to take away some of the thinking. They're just going to run and chase. And the final thing is he has success in Atlanta taking converted corners and putting it safety. Uh, DeMonte Kazi from San Diego State was a high-level corner with a bunch of ball skills that they moved to safety. Brian Poole was another guy that had played corner that they moved to safety. So they may look at a guy like a Reggie Robinson and say, well, maybe we can fit him in at safety because he does have some ball skills, and it may be easy for him just to be a numbers-to-numbers -numbers play in the middle of the field. Do you know if there's another guy, maybe even a veteran, that is up for contract renewal, like a, a Jordan Lewis or maybe a Cheeto Wuzier, that Dan Quinn would might might look at and say, "Hey, I want him back, but I don't want him as a corner. I want him to be as a safety to kind of go into that transfer mode like that." Bucky, you know, I don't know if, if those guys would do it. I mean, like, like. I Lewis is, is interesting because of the nickel presence and because he did a variety of different roles. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like, I don't know. what Cheeto doesn't necessarily strike me as that guy, but I think it all comes down to, to money and price point and value and what can you salvage. Because Cheeto and those guys played under Chris Richard in that system, and the system is very, very similar, maybe it's salvageable in that aspect. Um, I do wonder. I also wonder, and, like, I know no one wants to hear this, but – I do wonder about the Earl Thomas conversation coming down the pipe because of the previous relationship down the road. Like, if you're going to get someone who is down and out, if any time, this would be the time just because maybe the coach's relationship with Earl and Earl is in a level of maybe desperation when it comes to trying to get back into the league. Oh, I've heard it already on Twitter. People I was going to say, Bucky, I think <laughs> people want to hear that. Like, they yeah. absolutely want to hear that. 
I think yeah. it's the media that doesn't necessarily want to hear it, or the coaching <laughs> well, staff that doesn't necessarily well, want to hear it. But did, did Earl Thomas in this time off get help? That's the yeah. question. I mean, they, they, sure. you know, and, and mm -hmm. I hate to I hate to be the guy that always says, "Well, why hasn't someone else offered him? Why hasn't?" Mm -hmm. There's a lot oh, of yeah. there's a lot of skeletons there. There's a lot yes. of things that you know that Earl Thomas has to be able. When Bucky you talk about checking all the boxes and stuff, there are things that Earl Thomas has to go back. And, and now that his career has stopped. They go back and say, "Okay, did I correct this? Did I correct this?" I, there's plenty of people, and, and, and Bucky it, it knows this better than than anybody. Scouts will love to talk, but just don't use my name. Don't use my name here. I'm going to yeah. tell you something. Don't use my name. There are plenty of scouts, front office people, talking about Earl Thomas and some of the issues he had. If he's got those things behind him, then this then, then that makes a whole heck of a lot of sense uh, to go and get a guy like that. Now, Brian, whenever it came to Dan Quinn and this hiring process, I mean, it took a, mo a, a virtual interview at first, and then he flew in and talked with Mike McCarthy. But uh, in order for this to work, there had to be buy-in on both sides. The Cowboys had to look at Dan Quinn and say, yes, you're the right guy to fix our defense. And Dan Quinn had to look at the Cowboys specifically and see their personnel and say, I'm good enough to fix this defense. So, Brian, I want to hear, if you were in Dan Quinn's shoes, what would be your elevator pitch on how to sure up a defensive side of the football that struggled so much in 2020. Yeah, that's, you know, I mean, Bucky made a really, really good point about your the level of defense. With with your offense the way it currently is, you know, Rod Marinelli, Chris Richard had this team last year, or well, two years ago, I guess now, 11th in the league in scoring defense. This defense just needs to be middle of the pack, you know, I mean, and but – you know, Dan, if you're going to sell, you've got to sell all those players that we've been talking about. You've got to sell Donovan Wilson. Hey, I could do this with him as a safety. You've got to sell, you know, you start talking about Jalen Smith and Jerry's eyes all of a sudden brought, light up. But everybody mm -hmm. else is like going, mm -hmm. oh, no, like that. You know, you, you got to sell, okay, hey, I saw what you did with Randy Gregory. Or I like this. This is what we could do. Hey, I think with you know we, we want to play run defense right here. We could use Demarcus Lawrence. I could have some pass rush stuff with him. You just got to sell the fixes. You've got to sell the fixes, and you've got to say, hey, but if you could help me with the draft, if you could help me with the draft, this is what I could use. I could use this type of defensive. Uh, I could use this three technique. I could use this one technique. I need this type of safety. I need this type of corner. So you just sell the idea. Now, let me, I'll say this about Dan Quinn. There were whispers about Dan Quinn, Matt Patricia, like early in December, like the yeah. first month of December. I mean, right, right around the first, as soon as the calendar flipped, they were already starting to look at defensive coordinators out there. So mm -hmm. this to me was there. This wasn't one of those. Oh, let's knee jerk hire. This was like, wait a minute, we probably are going to have to do something here at the end of the day. And so they were already looking at things that Dan Quinn could do. To, to help this defense. And, and But like I said, his sell is how do you take the current players and bring them up to another uh, another level and how do you get the defense not to be 31st in the league but be 15th and maybe be top 12 when it comes to scoring defense. That That's what he's going to have to sell and evidently he did that to the Joneses. Brian, I think the other thing, I think this is an admission that culturally something was wrong on that side of the ball. And I don't think they could admit it and say, hey, let's bring Rod Marinelli and Chris Richard back because we now admit that we have messed up in terms of letting things slip. But Dan Quinn comes from the same thing. And what you're going to see is when we get to the practice field and we finally see these guys, you're going to hear about the brotherhood and you're going to hear a level of accountability. You're going to hear him talk about running to the ball and playing together. And we're going to make it simple. So now everything is about your effort and energy and all of those things. I think this hire was about that. Also, we'll say this. I think Mike McCarthy may realize as the head coach, someone has to be the heavy. And on this staff, there wasn't anybody that could be the heavy. When it's going around to be like, hey, you know what? We're not doing this in those meetings. Dan Quinn can play the heavy, even though he is super positive. That head coach pedigree, I think his leadership will be invaluable because if Mike McCarthy wants to be the CEO, Somebody has to be the barker. I would think that he would be the guy that is barking at the team when necessary. Dave, anything to add on that? 
No, I, I think Brian's absolutely right. And actually, it was it was just last year, or yeah, I mean 20, 2019, they were 11th in scoring and they were 5th the year before that with a very similar level of talent. And I, like I said, not, you know, when I say, when I called it a knee-jerk reaction, I don't mean to hire Dan Quinn. Like, I'm sure that they did their due diligence. Obviously, Dan Quinn has been unemployed since October, and they've known they were going to move on from Mike Nolan at least since early December. But when I say knee-jerk, I just basically mean I think the front office sat down and they were like, what is our quickest path back to having a respectable defense? Mm-hmm. And I think I think this was it. I, you know, Going back to what they already know with an experienced coordinator – uh, and and a similar amount of you know this basically the same talent that they had two seasons ago. This is the fastest course back to having a better defense. That's kind of the way I feel about it, and I've said this on a couple of shows already. But I'm glad that nobody is learning on the job at this point, and, and I'm glad that. It, yeah. You've done that experiment on the offensive side of the football with Kellen Moore, and you've had a younger mm-hmm. coordinator come up and kind of learn on the job as a part of the Dallas Cowboys. I'm glad you didn't do that with a defensive coordinator, at least at the same time, and have it both ways. And you talk about being the heavy Bucky. That was initially my first thought was, hey, this is a guy who can come in and be that right-hand man and be that second enforcer for Mike McCarthy on this coaching staff. I don't think Mike Nolan did that, or at least the no. players respected him enough to do that. So I think Dan Quinn brings that extra level of maturity and experience that, hey, I've been to the mountaintop. I've been and won Super Bowls as a coordinator. I've been to a Super Bowl as a head coach. I've done it on multiple occasions in multiple spots. That means I can do it again here, and hopefully Cal, that's ultimately ends up being the case. I think it also signals that all the conversation that we're here on the outside about Dak Prescott, I think the conversation is Dak Prescott is coming back because I think when you make this move for the defense to be like this, it's saying that our offense is going to be a top five offense because the quarterback is coming back, not because we're going to break in a new or different quarterback. I think if you look at that, I think that conversation had to be had to be had if they want to get up and running. Either that, like that. Or they, either that or they pray that Dan Quinn has a top five defense. <laughs> <laughs> And James Winston can lead him to the promised land. Oh, God. There we go. Mac Jones at 10. Hey, he's going to run, run hey, it up. Hey, Bucky, let's get those trade charts out. What do we got to do to get up to five? We were sitting in the four hole. We, and yeah, everybody no. wanted to start winning games again. Not me. I'm no. sitting just fine there in the let's four go, hole. Let's go get Zach no. Wilson, everybody. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, that, tur- that took a turn out of nowhere. I love it, Brian. All right, when we come back, Twitter on the 20. Is there a s- single position from the Dallas Cowboys that could be marched completely off of the draft board? I don't think so, but we're going to talk about ones that maybe could be when we come back on the other side of the break here on the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. There's nothing as unique as our eyes, which is why SLR pioneers ways to make lenses as unique as you. Verilux for super sharp vision, Essential Blue for protection, and Crizol for freedom from glare. Three cutting edge solutions in a single unique lens. So whatever your needs, insist on Essilor. Visit your local Essilor experts and find the perfect lens for you. See more, do more, Essilor. Since 1865, Stetson hats are American made with pride right here in Texas. And Stetson is proud to be on the field with America's team. Want to show your Texas and team pride too? You can. By purchasing your own Stetson, you can look just like how the flag guys do on field at every home game. Stetson hats, the official crown of all self-respecting Cowboys and your favorite football team. Get yours today at shop.dallascowboys.com or at stetson.com. I'm Jay Novacek, former tight end for the Dallas Cowboys. Back in the day, I was the guy who always got the tough yards, and that's why I run with John Deere today. In fact, I have a John Deere 3025E tractor that can handle any yard work I need to do, even the tough yards way out back. So if you have one acre or a thousand, John Deere has the equipment that's just right for you. Visit a John Deere dealer today and run with us. We are the official tractor provider of your Dallas Cowboys. Dear, it's 1908. Don't you think we should get electricity? Hmm, and stop using candles to see at night. It's just electricity lights up the room fast. It's more reliable than candles blowing out, and people seem to love it nationwide. Well, candles are... Dear, did you just run into the wall? Nope. 
May I have a new candle, please? Historically, switching to new technology is a no-brainer. Today, it's AT&T 5G. Fast, reliable, secure, and nationwide. Switch to AT&T 5G. It's not complicated. 5G requires compatible plan. May not be in your area. See att.com slash 5G for you for details. This is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. On to the second segment here on the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. And, hey, since we moved to 10 o'clock, this can actually be at the uh, in the 20s. So it's time now, as always, for some Twitter on the, on 20. the 20. There we go, Chris Beam, as always. And we've got a bevy of questions today, some really, really good ones. We're going to start things off with our pal Roman. And Roman says, when judging first-round corners... Any consideration of who pairs Beth best with Trayvon Diggs in terms of matchup options? For example, Diggs and Sertan combo would seem like a lack of wheels guy who uh, can keep up with the burner types is kind of what he was saying. So basically, who do you want to pair with Trayvon Diggs? And does that go into specific consideration from a scout's perspective and from a front office perspective, Brian, whenever you're looking at making a pick at 10 at the cornerback spot? Yeah, I think you have to evaluate who your, you know, who your roster is and the type of makeup. And you know, you have to determine. Dan Quinn's going to come in and say, you know, hey, I've got this type of corner that can that can cap- is capable of traveling. I've got a slot corner. I've got a guy that, you know, I might have to hide a little bit here. But yeah, I, I, I but I think what you do is you just you put those guys on the board and you evaluate them the best you can with the traits that the coaches have asked you, hey, I need this type of a player. And, you know, the whole idea is to get as many of those guys as you can. So to basically say, hey, we're going to, just because Diggs can't do this and the slot can't do this, we're got to go get this kind of guy. I think if you start think about that way, you have a disjointed group in the secondary. And I but I think you want guys, if everybody tends to have the same skill, you know, then I feel like, though, that you can make more of the matchup things that you want to do. So I wouldn't just say, okay, we're going to just do this because we have digs or this slot. I, I think they do it because, hey, this guy could play, this guy could play, and this guy could play. And they're all within our group of what we think the trade should be. Yeah, Brian, it's, it's, it's funny because I, I dug into my trusty little, whenever I pour this out, just know I'm, I'm digging into the notes. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm reading what I wrote down about Caleb Farley. I don't think it changes the draft board at all, like right now at the top. I sure. think like Caleb Farley, Pat Sertan, the second, I think all those guys fit. Farley is interesting just because if you look at Dan Quinn and the system, they normally don't have burners on the outside. Typically, their thing is length ball skills because they're going to press and bail and they're going to run out of there and do those things or whatever and so I think you do want to look at the tandem and you would like to have someone in the stable that can run around and do the slot stuff and maybe match up with a speed guy but I think the big thing is you have to be a great tackle and you have to have some length so you can walk up and put your hands on people Uh, I think that is going to be their calling card and you know we'll see because Al Harris is in the secondary. Maybe Al Harris can take those guys and kind of teach them how to press and do some of that stuff that he used to do in Greenback. Yeah, they they took the Atlanta took the you know everybody depending on what you thought about the Clemson corner last year. I mean Atlanta was on mm-hmm. that kid the whole time. AJ, I mean people yeah. yeah people they I mean they AJ had Terrell. him yeah they had him way up on the board and you know as one of their I mean I, I remember dealing with those guys and I'm like. Well, what did you like? And there, you know, everything. Because I was trying to think, I had like two or three guys that I would have taken ahead, and I and I was wondering. But to your point, Bucky, that's what they're saying. The traits that they looked at, like, okay, this kid can do this. He can run. He can play press. He can turn. You know, all those things. So yeah, they were they took a different style of corner than maybe most people really thought about taking last year. Do you think that you you mentioned Bucky a moment ago about the length? I mean, Caleb Farley, 6'2", 200 pounds, and maybe even a little bit less than that whenever the the weigh-ins come mm-hmm. around. But uh, do you think the length there is enough to to get Dan Quinn excited at ten enough to, to to maybe say, hey, he does fit into this system as kind of a bigger, longer corner, even though he does have all the measurables? Well, I mean, I mean, certainly that is there. But the one thing, Atlanta was so different than Seattle, so you're trying to figure out which one he is because Seattle never invested, <laughs> That's a good point. never invested right. in corners. They they would find their guys down the line and they would develop them. Some of that is they Pete Carroll's a DB guy. 
as a head coach. And so he, he takes a fancy in developing those guys. They put a lot of time and energy into developing them. Dan invested in corners at the top of the board. And so I would think that he would probably want a more refined product. And so maybe Farley and Sertan and those guys, J.C. Horn and those guys would fall into that conversation because of the length. The length is important not only because of the press part of it, but because down the field when you're playing these wide receivers and the 50-50 balls, can they knock the balls away when you have to make these contested plays? And so that plays a part of it. But, you know, it'll be, it'll be interesting. But I do think you'll see the, the six-foot-plus corners. I think that will be very, very much in vogue for the Cowboys going forward. My dream of Asante Samuel Jr. has died. Yeah, like yeah, you might probably. be in trouble yeah, that, on that. Yeah. And, uh, mm-hmm. You don't think I they mean, could they could get him later and then develop him into a oh, guy? Oh, he's right? he's going to go right. somewhere. Be, they're they're not going to be able to get back around to him. I I don't think they are. I mean, because yeah, Bucky's right. This guy's going to take. He's going to take tall. This is look at all the tall corners in this draft. The guy's over six foot. J.C. Horn yeah. from South Carolina. Look at every one of those guys. Six feet, bigger, long armed guys. I, I I think that's the direction that the Cowboys are going to go. I feel like that's that's a pretty good uh, standpoint. Now moving on into our second question, Richmond asked, and I want to start with Dave on this one. Is there any position that the Cowboys should not spend a pick on? And he's gonna he excludes fullback, kicker, and punter in the 2021 draft. And if there is a position, why would it be that position? Uh, I'll cheat a little bit. I mean, I'll I'll say premium pick because if you're talking about the entire draft, I mean, you can draft whoever the hell you want to once you get down to the sixth and seventh rounds. I mean. They did it with Ben DiNucci last year. Like, no, nobody had heard of Ben DiNucci. Like, we, we hadn't even heard <laughs> of Ben DiNucci. It was Dane um, Brugler and Dane Brugler only. Yeah, seriously. So, I, do literally do whatever you want once you get to the sixth and seventh rounds. Uh, but, as far, I mean, you know, it's ironic because I was one of the big team 40-burger guys last year. But unless you're Bri- – Brian, I'll make this concession for Brian – Unless you're forced into a situation where Kyle Pitts is the only pick that makes sense, uh, this team doesn't have any business drafting a a pass catcher with a premium pick. First, second, or third round, I don't know how you justify that with, you know, Amari Cooper, CeeDee Lamb was your first round pick last year. You still have a year of Michael Gallup. Blake Jarwin is under contract for three more years and is coming back. Dalton Schultz emerged as a reliable guy. I just don't know how you do that unless you're really forced into a situation where you don't have another choice. And, obviously, you know, we don't like to window dress the board. If Kyle Pitts is clearly that much better than everybody, then you, you should probably take him. But if you can, you got to find a way to avoid that, whether My, it's trading yeah. down or, yeah. you know, erring toward defense. I just I don't know how you do that this year. I think if they make an offensive pick, guys, I think it, it, if he, the guy's there, it's going to be Slater, the offensive tackle from mm-hmm. Northwestern. That's who I think. If yeah. if they, you know, Which, if they're going to look at these defensive guys hard, and you know, now with Dan involved, I mean, I'll tell you a guy that I, the Ojolari from Georgia, and I know they've got a couple of defensive mm-hmm. ends and stuff like that. But if there's somebody that's sitting like at 15 that has a chance to maybe be at 10, I, I would I would take a look at that type of a player there more than pay or one of those other guys but to me if they go offense if they go offense again my dreams of pits i think are gone but i i think that it would be i think slater would be that guy i just that that it just makes too much sense for them uh to if they got if they got stuck and they said okay Mm -hmm. just take the best player on the board Slater's going to be the best player on the board. I, I didn't. I didn't say you can't draft offense. I just said pass. Oh, I know. Catcher. No, no, I know. But it, yeah. I'm saying if they take an offensive guy, if they take an yeah. offensive guy, I think it's you know. Now, hell, they might take a quarterback, but you know, if that quarterback's there, so you know, you never know. Uh, it's, it's funny because the guy's name who's now going to be back in play, and I know it's going to drive JC crazy, but <laughs> I would not be surprised if Gregory Rousseau becomes yep. a, a, a topic of interest only because this is a, he's the same guy who saw something in Vic Beasley high and Vic Beasley and those they have similar traits in terms of the length and all of that other stuff so oh, Bucky, will, but Vic Beasley Vic Beasley was not very good though yeah he wasn't anything <laughs> special 
Which Bucky, whoa, whoa, wait, wait a minute. Hold on, wait a minute. No, no, no. This is two, no, is two no, shows no, wait, in a row wait. that Bucky's just killing everybody's vibe right now. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, here, here's, here's what I'm going to say the Gregory Rousseau and the Vic Beasley thing. Vic Beasley, when he was coming out of Clemson, I want to say he had 34, 35 sacks. It was up there with Von yeah, Miller. And then sure the one year in Atlanta when it popped, when he had 15 and a half. And 2016, right? Yeah, a bunch of forced fumbles and all that other stuff, like traits. And mm-hmm. he is a D-line guy. And you can never ignore the fact that he is a D-line guy. And That's he's going true. to see he's going to see flashes. He's going to be captivated by flashes that we may be like, ah, that's a throwaway. But the D-line coach is going to be like, man, I know I can get him to do X, Y, and Z. I see this developmental potential. So I'm just saying it Lucky. opens up some other stuff. You are just opens up. You are making stuff. me. You're giving me some Rod Marinelli flashbacks, and I'm not loving it right now. <laughs> well, hey, by the way, I can't wait to see that thirty for thirty on Rod in the draft and how he. How oh, he's the the hey, Rod, you remember? Rodden. You remember the way Rod used to walk into the war room at, like every freaking pick because somehow, like, I'm just imagining that all over again. Like mm. Dan just. Walking yeah. in there like, yeah, we're taking on arms table. crossed, like pointing at the board, you know, uh, kind of give it the hand yeah. gestures. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I can see that. The, I can see part that. Of the deal. It's part of the deal. <laughs> part That's of the it. fun part. It's fun part. The coach when the coaches come in. Uh, hey, Bucky, how many times you sit in a war room and the coaches walk in and you just want to just like you just want to you kind of throw yeah. up in your mouth? You just gotta. <laughs> oh, I have, you know, I have all, all. You know, all those something bad's about to happen. Something bad's about. I to love. Happen. I love hearing the coaches rank their top ten. Their top ten at a position. Mm-hmm. And you're like, who? What? <laughs> <laughs> That's the order. I don't like it. I don't like it. Get on that phone. Talk. Hey, I like this guy. I like this guy. Oh, we're going we're going straight back into twenty seventeen, just like we thought we would, right, everybody? All right. Well next question comes from Jeff Rice, and this is interesting for all those Aggie listeners out there. I know there's a couple of them listening for sure, but do you think Kellen Mond would be a good developmental quarterback behind Dak Prescott, maybe in the middle rounds of that draft? Do you see any of the same traits as Dak. Brian, we'll start with you. Really don't. Really don't. don't uh, you know, I, I just, you know, I, I feel like, though, to me, Kellen Mond was a guy, and I and, and Dave and I sat at Kyle Field and watched a seven-overtime game. And Why you got to bring that up? And I was amazed. I was like, man, this guy's making throw after throw after throw. And then all of a sudden he has another year where – and I thought that Jimbo – and you know, it give Texas A&M a lot of credit for their record, the, the games they won, going to get a bowl game victory like they did. I just don't see it with Kellen Mond. I just don't see the processing. You know, I, I see the, the, the size and things like that, but just overall how you play, the, the, you know, how you read, how do you react. I just think there's just too much there to have to deal with. So I, I would, I, I would, I would focus on some some other guys. Uh, if you were talking about backup developmental guys, Kellen Mond would not be one of my guys that I would choose. This yeah, is, I, I would, I would, I would concur. I would agree. I, the biggest surprise for me. That's dangerous, seeing, Bucky, because I usually suck at evaluating quarterbacks. No, so. but, that, <laughs> but the biggest surprise for me is seeing the success that Texas A&M had with him as the starting quarterback. I never yeah. would have imagined that this would have been a top ten, almost a top five team with him at quarterback. Right. He did some really good things there, but I don't think. I don't see any of the similar characteristics. I don't think he's a tough or physical runner. Um, I think he's okay as a passer and, and, and playmaker in that regard. But I don't see any of the stuff that I saw at Mississippi State with Dak. I don't see Kellen Mond having any of those traits. This rule of thumb will probably bite me. At, like It's definitely not universal. But if I'm going to invest something significant in a quarterback, I need to see him lift his team. Like, do you know, he, he needs to be the reason why they win – or, you know, he needs to be the only thing going. You know, you, you know, Dak, those Mississippi State teams, you know, Mississippi State puts a lot more talent in the NFL than they used to, but they're still not Alabama. And they didn't Dak, have anybody. Dak, right. Nobody. And, but, <laughs> yeah. but Dak lifted them to highs that they yes. were never on. Even, you know, Cardell Jones, who did not have a great NFL career, still, you know, he took over the college football playoff when he got his opportunity. And, you know, I, I said the same thing about Daniel Jones. Is like, if Daniel Jones is worth a top 10 pick, I should have seen more from him at Duke. Even at Duke. I know Duke doesn't have any talent, but if you're worth a top 10 pick, you should be capable of lifting Duke to a high that they weren't capable of. And I never once saw that from Kellen Mond at A&M. Did you think Patrick Mahomes took Texas Tech to new heights? 
Patrick Mahomes didn't take them to new heights, but holy crap, was he amazing every time okay. he got on the field. I mean, they That's were fair. routinely scoring 60, 70 points. And their and defense was just yeah, terrible. Yeah. The, the, yeah. tech, the tech basketball team is a top four, a top, you know, final four team every year. They don't score as many points as Mahomes had to at Tech. Mahomes, it was a cra- <laughs> it was crazy watching him play because every week he was he knew he had to throw five or six touchdowns. Every week he knew that, you know, and I, I think that there's some places that these quarterbacks end up, it's unfortunate for them because they are. You see, yeah, they, they, the reason why the team even has a chance is because of him, and that I think that's what Mahomes, you know, yeah. uh, with, what did with uh, with that that's, with that program. And that's kind of my and all all credit to A and M. They won eight games in a row. You know, they they might finish number two in the final polls. They had a great season, but nobody. Nobody on A and M's schedule was like, "Oh, watch out! We got Mond this week." Oh, I don't know about this. Like that. Yeah, no way. There has to be some wild wow factor to the quarterback. Like you talk about Pat Mahomes, it, he was the hardest evaluation for me because I'd never seen, i never seen a Sandlot player go to the league and have success where they yeah. refine their game or whatever. With Kellen Mond, I don't know if I ever watched. Look, they played Carolina in the Orange Bowl, and Carolina was depleted, and I didn't come away from that game game being like, "Wow, Kellen Mond was the best player on the field." Like, I was like, they got good running backs. They're real fast on defense, uh, stuff like that. But I didn't see enough wow or whoa type plays. And I think the way the game is going, your quarterback better be able to deliver some stuff because your offensive line can't block these guys that are up front. And so he has to be able to make some wild plays once, twice, three times a game to be able to sustain the offense. So maybe that question wasn't for the Aggies. Maybe it was against the Aggies or for everybody who doesn't like the Aggies, I guess. Uh, I overall, bet but. I bet most Aggie fans agree with that analysis, yeah, if I, I had to I've guess. Definitely have friends that would agree 100% with that, I think, overall. Now, final question as we're running out of time for this segment. But RH asks, what's easier to get in round one versus round two and round three? Cornerback, offensive tackle, defensive tackle where do those kind of fit into those three slots i'm gonna be biased i'm gonna say it's always easy to find corners Mm -hmm. um because i think depending on the system that you play or whatever you can manufacture a corner i think offensive tackles you need to take them early okay yeah, I think Bucky's absolutely right. It depends. I mean, some of these corners are probably initially were looked at as probably fifth round guys on a lot of boards when these scouts went out, you know, and started their process. And now, uh, you know, for example, I- I'm thinking about the kid, you know, uh, Tyson Campbell from from Georgia, probably a mm-hmm. fourth round guy that might have elevated himself as up into the thing. Uh, Job from Alabama. I mean, there's some guys that are kind of that you, you look at and you're thinking, well, man, they started at this level, now they're up. I, I just think that the corner spot is a little bit of a deeper thing. Uh, Molden is another kid from Washington. You know, there's there's corners on these, on, that's going to be on this board that, you know, if you miss in that first round, you know, you get the second, the third round, I think that position's going to run a little bit deeper for you uh, to be able to, to grab. You, if you... You're talking about, and we've seen a draft where the last couple of years, offensive tackles have actually been pretty good. You know, this yeah. looks like another class that has that same kind of thing. So, I'm, I'm, I, but I'm, I'm with Bucky. I think I can, I can wait on corners, grab those offensive linemen first when you can. I was about to. Say, I mean, I don't know if I don't think this class is as good as last year's with Werfs and Becton and those guys. But, you know. Everybody's been so focused on Panay Sewell and Rashawn Slater. I know, you know, Christian Derisau out of Derisau's Virginia Tech. good, yeah. But yeah. then, uh, sh- shoot, uh, the Alabama guy, Alex Leatherwood, looks like Leatherwood. a beast. He looks like a beast, too. Uh, he was so, supposed to be a top 15 pick last year before yeah. he returned back to Alabama. This looks like another class where, you know, and we know how we know how valuable the position is and we know how hard it is to find good ones. It's a lot like quarterback where I think, you know, maybe if they're not even purely the best players on the board, you could talk me into thinking, you know, three to five of these guys go in the top 20 for sure. Man, I, I think there's going to be a run on I think when in doubt, you take an offensive, offensive tackle. And the yeah. way the game is going, you can't even separate a right tackle and left tackle. Both guys need to be able to dance on the, on the perimeter because – teams are flipping what they're doing with their pass rushes and putting them on that side to mm-hmm. take advantage of it. I think you have to be able to 
protect on the edges and with the running game and all those things. So I think Dolphins tackles are very, very valuable. Yeah, Especially whenever about, you yeah. look at Chase Young on the other side of the division that you're yeah. going to have to go up against for the next couple of years. Yeah, I, I don't. I hope I'm not butchering this kid's name, but you talk about tackles. I watched the kid, that Eichenberg from Notre Dame, uh, and then the yeah. tackle, uh, Liam Eichenberg. I, I think I'm saying it right. If not, mm-hmm. I can. But I, I, I'll tell you this though, there's some there's some guys that you talk the kid at Texas. I think there's some tackles in this thing. Mm-hmm. Dave's right. It's not probably the level that we saw last year. But man, there's some kids that can play, and you know, you plug them in, and, and they'll they'll be just fine. Though the way you there's there's so many of these kids now that they're in this passing pass mode, pass mode, pass mode, and then all of a sudden you watch them block and stuff, and they're like, man, they get it, you know. And then when they watch them in the run game, they fit, they finish. So you know, it, it's it's a pretty good group to evaluate right now. Yeah, Samuel Cosme's up there in the first round conversation, the kid out of Texas, like you said, Brian. And then about Liam Eichenberg, you got his name right. He's a senior bowl guy. Yeah. Uh, it, and there's another senior bowl guy I'm really excited to look at, Dylan Reduns, it might be his name. He's out of North Dakota State. And, I, I mean, I think he's going to be something interesting, one of those kind of FCS products that might be talked about in the early couple of rounds. So there's a couple guys that are going to be in Mobile on, at the offensive tackle spot that are very intriguing. Okay, so we're going to take a uh, second and step aside. When we come back, who upped their stock last night out of the, the – I almost called it the BCS National Championship game. I'm going back to 2008. Uh, who upped their stock yesterday in the college football playoff National Championship game, and did it change your mind on the way to look at receivers in this draft? We'll be right back here on the Dallas Cowboys. Draft show. We're back with a tasty treat that's sweeping airwaves and taste buds. It's new Dr. Pepper and Cream Soda. Let's take a listen. Dr. Pepper and Cream Soda's here. A new combo that's music to my ears, okay? Let's play. Cream Soda and Dr. Pepper time. Pour it in a glass of ice. Ah, music to my ears and mouth. New Dr. Pepper and Cream Soda. There's nothing as unique as our eyes, which is why Essilor pioneers ways to make lenses as unique as you. Verilux for super sharp vision, Essential Blue for protection, and Crizol for freedom from glare. Three cutting edge solutions in a single unique lens. So whatever your needs, insist on Essilor. Visit your local Essilor experts and find the perfect lens for you. See more, do more. Essilor. The Cowboys way, where 16 Hall of Famers and five championships shows us what success looks like. Where turkey is always the second best part of Thanksgiving Day. Where we are all defined by one single thing, the star. Where we as fans know it's our job to keep the tradition going. Bank of America is proud to be the official bank of the Dallas Cowboys and to support the quest of living life the Cowboys way. Copyright 2020, Bank of America Corporation. Dear, it's 1908. Don't you think we should get electricity? Hmm, and stop using candles to see at night. It's just electricity lights up the room fast. It's more reliable than candles blowing out, and people seem to love it nationwide. Well, candles are... Dear, did you just run into the wall? Nope. May I have a new candle, please? Historically, switching to new technology is a no-brainer. Today, it's AT&T 5G. Fast, reliable, secure, and nationwide. Switch to AT&T 5G. It's not complicated. 5G requires compatible plan. May not be in your area. See att.com slash 5G for you for details. This is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. Back here on episode 8 of the 2021 edition of the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. Kyle Yeomans with you. Brian Broaddus, Bucky Brooks, and David Hellman wrapping up another fun episode. And just after the college football wrapped up another crazy season, probably the most unforgettable season uh, of college football that we will all experience. And hopefully it's the last time we have to deal with COVID-19 as a college football uh, playoff season. But Alabama comes out on top. They dominate their way to a national championship. First wall-to-wall number one ranked team in the history of the uh, the college football playoff rankings. And they go from week one until the final week of the year and did not waver. They were number one the entire way. But uh, based on kind of some of the conversations that we had last week, gentlemen, and we kind of talked about it a little bit on this show, we really previewed the game on the Thursday show 
But who up their stock? Because the there were scouts, or uh, even looking at at what Dane Brugler said last week, he said that scouts do put these big games into consideration because it's the big stage, it's against the best competition. There's a lot that goes into it. But I want to know who last night, Bucky, raised their stock from either side of the football, Alabama or Ohio State. Well, I mean, I think it's easy. Devontae Smith put on a he put on an absolute show, and I think the thing that um, you like about him is he's an outstanding route runner. He has great hands. He does a great job of creating separation. I think what Sark was able to do was he was able to, when the coaches look at it, he was able to give them a blueprint for the imagination that you can use and the creativity that you can use to really get him open. My biggest thing has been his size and how are you going to help him kind of deal with some of the physicality and stuff that he'll face when lining up. But the way that they used him last night, um, I think he helped himself. You know, even though he went out the game with an injury, the fact that he can do that, and I made the point on Twitter, the fact that he can return punts, some of the questions about toughness and courage, they go away because the punt return thing solves that and eliminates that for a lot of scouts and coaches. The uh, the fake jet motion that they ran with him in the first or second quarter was disgusting. Like, that was, <laughs> that was so much fun. Um... No, that's my biggest – so two names jump out to me. One is obviously Devontae Smith, and I'm devastated because, you know, maybe at the start of the night I was like, oh, maybe Devontae Smith falls to 10 and the Cowboys can use him as trade bait. He ain't, he ain't falling to 10. Yeah, that's he's not played, happening. He's, he, played on the, he played on his home field for the draft. He played last yeah, night. He was on his home field. field. Yeah. I, yeah. You might, I mean, Miami makes a lot of sense. Philadelphia makes a lot of sense, unfortunately. Mm. Um, so that's the big one. And then uh, I think we talked about him at the top, but Christian Barmore was all over the damn place. And yep. in, a, in a draft that doesn't have a premier defensive tackle, if he wasn't a first-round pick before last night, I think he definitely is now. Yeah, you know, I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach. And, I, you know, I, the quarterback position, I was laughing that I, I don't evaluate very well. But, I mean, I've hit on a couple here lately. I was right about Josh Allen. I'm patting myself on the back because I'm usually <laughs> wrong. But, As you should. Yeah, but I'll, I'll tell you this, though. Mac Jones in a big-time game. And, you know, Ohio State didn't have their big-time defense. I mean, there was some struggles there with it. But the way he commanded the offense, the way he ran it, the way, you know, other than the sack and the fumble and stuff like that, the way he was able to bounce back, I think that, you know, maybe if you had some questions about him going in, last night he answered, I mean, the, the touch, the accuracy, yeah, he plays with great players, he has a, a, a nice offensive line, but, you know, you've, you've got to make those throws. You've got to be able to read, make the throws, have touch, uh, body type wise, he looks like a 1970s quarterback. You know what I'm saying? He's not what we're used to seeing. But I think as far as a guy helping himself with how he played and how he handled the big stage, I think some people are going to consider him on the back end of this uh, the draft, possibly at the end of the the first round of this draft. So, and then also to the tackle, you know, with Leatherwood. I, I you know, you watch him; he's just got such balance. He's a big guy. He moves easily. You know, again, when you start talking about these offensive tackles, and you know, coming out last year, you know, he would have probably been right in the mix. But I think he's even inching himself up the board a little bit more, depending on who you like. You like the Virginia Tech kid, you know, you like Northwestern. Who do you really like? I think he's kind of put himself in the conversation with the toughness he's shown, the athletic ability, and the size that he played with last night. You know, it's, it's interesting, Brian. I, I'm going to mention this. I, I thought maybe one of you guys mentioned Najee Harris. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think Najee Harris, the last few games, I think he has helped himself more than anybody else. And not just because of the running ability. He is an outstanding pass catcher. Yes, he like, is. And he can run routes. And so if we're talking about a position that people don't necessarily like to invest in, I'm all about investing in a big guy that can run inside and also make things happen in the passing game. I think for me, he has separated himself from Travis Etienne and some of the other running backs that people have talked about being first-round picks. He's I flip flopped him as well, Bucky. I, I I like his size too. I mean, six two two thirty compared to Etienne, who is five ten two ten, and the fact that he can run as well as he can, the way he makes a man miss. He he. I mean, even last night, you look at the way that he just had tacklers bounce off of him. 
or just cut back inside the one play where he was kind of out in the flats and he caught the ball, kind of bobbled it a yes. little bit, and then he took it back in and then dove into the end zone. I was impressed by that. There, that, that athleticism is there from Najee Harris to the point where I was, I mean, I was really impressed with what he brought to the table. Now, one thing I did min- or did notice just a second ago is the fact that all of the names outside of Barmore <laughs> were on the offensive side of the football. Was there anybody that hurt their stock last night defensively? One that comes to mind, one name that comes to mind, might have been Sean Wade. But also, I mean, you look at Dylan Moses, the linebacker from Alabama. I wasn't necessarily impressed with what he brought to the table last night. Sertan, he played well, but overall, I mean, it was kind of a, a ho-hum night for Patrick Sertan. But anybody that sticks out from a defensive standpoint? I wonder if teams are going to look at Wade as a safety. You know, I, I, I mean, I was just, you know, when you talk about how do you handle things off the line, you know, how do you put yourself in position? I mean, the guy had a lot of questions about him coming into the game. And, man, you, you saw not that Alabama receivers are an easy cover by any means. You know, Waddle was compromised last night. He did the best he could to play. But, I mean, you look at Wade, I, I, I wonder, I really wonder. I was proud to see him, like, early in the game come up, make a play down on the goal line where he read it, got up there, got a tackle for loss, and I thought, eh, maybe he is a safety. Maybe he's not a cornerback here. But I, I saw some problems there with with some of the, the separation and how he played mm-hmm. on the line. It kind of made me feel like, okay, I, I feel like I evaluated this guy right going in that I, I don't have him as one of those – surefire top flight guys if someone takes him i think they're going to make him a safety myself safety or nickel i think he has to play in the slot i think the reason why he's more effective in the slot is you rarely face the vertical threats in the slot like that and you always have the advantage of being able to play to your help either safety in the post or someone over the middle of the field i i I think one don't call out Devontae Smith for say that's who I want and then let Devontae Smith go for 215 in the first first half half. like that is a bad look like (laughs) that is something that in my notes I'm like yeah Um, I'm I'm mad at him for not evaluating himself and knowing that you don't want to take on that matchup like that I got one and so two two thoughts thinking about the linebackers um I was not very high on Dylan Moses going into this game. He's the name that, you know, he's probably the biggest name among defenders in this game. Maybe a top 15 pick, and or last year, I mean. In his defense, you know, he's coming off a major knee injury. I think he was quoted earlier this season as saying he doesn't feel all the way right. And I feel bad for him, but, like, just watching him, I, I don't see it. I don't see the instincts, and I don't see the athleticism that would make me want to draft him very highly. On the opposite side... I knew the name going into this game, but I didn't know a ton about uh, Baron Browning for Ohio State, yeah. and I thought mm-hmm. he, I thought he played a great game. Obviously, he had the strip sack mm-hmm. on uh, Mac Jones, but also just all night I felt like he was crashing down, setting the edge. He forced Najee Harris to cut back half a dozen times when he didn't want to, just redirecting plays and just generally seemed to be in position to make tackles. That's that's what I'm looking for. Is like I don't want to spend a top ten pick on a linebacker, but if you tell me I could get Baron Browning in the second round, let's go. I don't know if that's realistic, but I got excited thinking about the I possibility. The one thing you know to know about those Alabama linebackers when you get through their complete medical history, it, it, it's hell, hell, man. scary. You would they swear they're you, you would swear they're my age, you know, but. <laughs> Yeah. That's tough, man. It's tough on those kids because they're in so many collisions during the season and they get so banged up. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do like what you're saying about Browning. I, I thought that you know, he was the one guy defensively. And Ohio State was they, – they didn't, they, didn't get, they didn't show up. I mean, they got – not that they didn't show up, but they just did not have the horses yeah. to run that race. And Browning at least gave him a chance in some of those, uh, some of those uh, plays. I like Browning a lot. I mean, first off, I've, I've seen him play since he was in high school, the pride of Kennedale High School over near uh, Fort Worth. But I, I like what he brings to the table in terms of a speed perspective and somebody who can, like you said, read an offense. And I, that's what I saw last night, Dave. I was right there with you in the fact that he had it and, and Dylan Moses didn't. And, and that was kind of the, the big question for me. Okay, so final couple questions here before we wrap things up. How does this wide receiver class compare – to that one of last year and with Smith and and even Waddle if he's healthy and back ready to go which we assume he will be but you got Jamar Chase you've got Bateman 
You've got Marshall Jr. out of LSU compared to the guys like CeeDee Lamb, Justin Jefferson, Jerry, Judy, and Ruggs that were out of last year's class. Bucky, do you think that this class has any chance to stand up to the one from a year ago? Yeah, I think I think the classes that we'll see going forward will always be loaded with pass catchers. I think what we've seen is we've seen the um, impact that 7-on-7 seven seven has had. We're getting a more polished version of wide receivers in the NFL now more than ever. And the other thing that has happened with the stuff that's happened in the lower ranks, we're seeing better athletes at wide receiver and lesser athletes at DB because the top three or four athletes, the high school coach is taking them and putting them at wide receiver. And so the guys who are left at DB are athletes four, five, and six. And so that's the thing that we have to consider. But yeah, the athletes are outstanding. They're coming in ready to play. And I think this class would be like the last class where not only in the first round, but in the second, third round, we'll see guys that pop in and have immediate impacts. Yeah, what I'm looking forward to seeing is the old crusties. Will they, <laughs> will they, kill, will they kill Smith because of the weight? Will they kill because of the lack of bulk? And will they fall in love with Chase? Chase has become an, a kind of a forgotten guy in yeah. these wide receiver thoughts. Mm-hmm. And going into the season, that was your top guy. And now all of a sudden, you've got guys that have played during the season, Waddle and Smith and those guys. And, you know, now can Chase make up that ground? I, I hope that people don't forget. But, man, you look at him physically, you know, Krusty's love the, that look. They love what they, you know, that, that looks like a wide receiver, you know. But will, will Smith be able to maintain that level? The tape is tremendous. But will Krusty say, man, but he's only 170 pounds. He's 170 <laughs> pounds. You know, the, I, I just wonder if, the, I wonder if, there, if there's a real gap or, or now are we on a, an even, even playing field with these two guys. In a world where Tyree Kill is doing what he's doing, yeah. I don't I don't think Jamar Chase is going to – or I'm sorry, not Jamar Chase, Devontae Smith is going to fall too far. And it turns out sitting out might have been a great decision on Jamar's part. I just – I don't – you know, who knows what his stock would look like if he had played the whole season on that LSU team. Well, Marshall, would... Marshall wasn't terrible. We talked about Marshall. He wasn't. Yeah, yeah but Marshall, they, but... he was the only thing LSU had. Yeah, but – catching 10, 11 balls every time. He also yeah. was like, after like seven or eight games, he was like, you know what? Enough of this. I don't yeah. want to do this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, this this receiver class is gross in a good way. Like, I'm, I'm looking at the list right now. Like, you get 10 or 11 or 12 names deep. Like, Elijah Moore out of Ole Miss? Yeah. Hell, like hell of a player. Yeah. Tylen mm-hmm. Wallace at Oklahoma State? Awesome wide receiver. And that, you know, I don't even know what to do with Kadarius Toney. He's, I mean, Drafting. somebody's... Well, exactly. Drafted. Somebody's going to draft him. Him and him and uh, Rondell Moore out of Purdue are going to get drafted on athleticism alone. Oh, wow. yeah. Moore, what a fun so, player to watch too. I'll tell you this: it's going to be it's going to be exciting for sure. And, and, and keep an eye on Bateman from Minnesota too. That's another. Don't big forget. Guy that makes don't play. forget. Don't forget about Rashad Bateman. Absolutely, and yeah. that's why I think you know we always talk about running backs and not investing in a first round running back. Brian knows in Green Bay we didn't draft wide receivers in the first round because you always can find the guy in the second and third round and you just rattled off a list of 10 guys why would I really invest in a first round wide receiver when I know I can find someone at the top of the second round that can give me maybe comparable value yeah, unless it's Smith from Alabama, then you invest, and you, you know, then you look like a genius, and you don't get fired, and you don't have to do the draft show, you know. Or Kyle Pitts, and you can figure it out, and you can work it with it from there, getting a pass catcher in the top ten. That's fine too. Yeah, uh, I just can't wait till for or future Dallas Cowboy, former North Texas alum Jalen Darden's picked in the fifth round by the Dallas Cowboys, and he ends up going for a thousand yards next year. That's my that's my one pipe dream for the Cowboys overall. Now, wow, bold. that's going to do it for us here on the DallasCowboys.com draft show. I'm dropping the mic on you, Dave. Uh, final time, uh, or excuse me, not the final time. When we come back uh, on Thursday, 10 a.m., it'll be uh, Dane Brugler, it'll be Jeff Cavanaugh, and KT Kevin Turner there as well. So be sure to join us on Thursday at 10 a.m. is, of course, the start time for the draft show. But for Brian Broaddus, for David Hellman, and for Bucky Brooks, I'm Kyle Yeoman saying so long. Appreciate you joining us here on the draft show. This has been a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys? Yeah!